Hello, good morning. Um, Terry asked me to briefly mention some of the tumors that we discuss in June and speak only about one, although in the small group sessions we may speak about all of them. Always show my favorite slide that we're a little slow, 4,600 years old. And in June, what I spoke about um, with Mark was MSI analysis and mismatch repair protein immunohistochemistry for systematic screening of Lynch syndrome in all resected colorectal cancers on our main campus. And the uptake is um, exceedingly good. At least 80% make it to genetics clinics. We also spoke about a slower implementation of the same types of analysis for Lynch syndrome screening for all endometrial cancers because it, it is a component. The uptake's a little less, 64%, and there are challenges, including, um, unlike colon, many different pathology labs doing it. This will probably be solved when everything will be sent into our central lab. We also discussed the integration of genetic counselors in now over 25 non-genetic specialty clinics on our main campus and the regional practice. And a prototype of a family-entered cancer family history tool. Today, Kate Nathanson from Penn and I are going to speak um, about routine screening for heritable neuroendocrine tumors. And we will look at pheochromocytoma. We could have picked medullary thyroid cancer, but this one's slightly more exciting, as our prototype. So pheos come from the adrenal medulla, and that means they're from neural crests. So neuroendocrine tumors in general come from neural crests. This one in particular can secrete catecholamines, and I don't think I have to tell this group that if it's not recognized, bad things happen. This is just a picture, an MRI, to show those who um, don't quite know where the adrenals are. Um, and, and that's an axial view, and that's the big purple arrow. Now, paraganglia can be anywhere, so they're along the paraganglial chain and can be sympathetic or parasympathetic. So this one happens to be in the thorax. Now, we learned in med school the famous 10% rule. 10% are genetic or heritable, 10% are bilateral, 10% are malignant. Now, we thought this was gospel until we started, meaning the world of we, started looking into it and the first genes appeared and does it really matter? Well, so much for the 10% rule. So let me tell you, to fast forward a lot of work probably over the last 10 to 15 years, um, many consortia and we have a population-based registry show that up to 30%, sometimes more, of all fields and paraganglial presentations have a genetic etiology. And those are some, but not all, of the known genes. So many genes, um, neuroendocrine tumors. So in theory, this is the ideal when you go through a germline mutation analysis. I've added in all the genes, um, there are actually 10. I didn't even put NF1 because we have found that in the presence of that NF1 pheos do not present unless they have physical stigma, of which hopefully we can, ex uh, we can actually recognize. And every gene has other features, other tumors, or different presentations. For example, let's take SDHB. There is a high malignancy rate, depending on who you believe, between 14 and 30 percent, whereas in some of the others, um, malignancy is rarely if ever seen. For RET, you have to worry about medullary thyroid cancer, and so on and so forth, VHL, renal tumors, um, SDHB and D, they are renal tumors. So it does affect management. Well, what have we done? We have embedded genetic counselors in endocrinology and endocrine surgery clinics. Um, in the literature, so that's all we've done. Penn has a pen net, so they're a little bit more systematic. In the literature, SDHB immunohistochemistry is said to be able to pick up those with germline SDHB, C, and D mutations, um, but not in the other syndromes that I showed you. A recent paper also showed this might be true for SDHA. This is routinely implemented at PennNet, and Kate tells me that the uptake is very, very good. However, our clinical pathologists, who are not slouches, get very inconsistent results. So if you ask 
them to read um, SDHB staining. It's all over the place. It's not correlated with any germline mutation. When we do Western blots and I give it to my lab to read it blindly, it can predict presence or absence. So, um, but this needs to be worked out. It looks like a very reasonable um, screening tool. And so with that, um, I will stop well within my time, eight minutes. Nope, we speak on each other's behalf. I'm, I'm, please add in. Right. So I think that this is a really important area that is really under-recognized um, in the community as something that really is affecting clinical practice. Are there, what happens if you sequence the tumors? What do you mean what happens? I mean, I, what, can, you, can you increase it from 60% to 95%? So we're, this is actually inherited mutations that right. we're talking about. So we have not gone back and resequenced the tumor. They're actually several issues about them. Um, I'm sorry, there's several, Karis can talk about what her experience is. So this is actually something that we're in the process of doing. Um, we've actually got funding to do this. But um, uh, the PGLs actually tend to get embolized before they get removed so that it can be very difficult to actually get decent tissue out to do them. Um, and then the FIOs obviously can be relatively small or problematic, but um, actually, at least at Penn, we're in the process of collecting fresh frozen tissue. There are some studies, Karis may talk about that, um, that have shown these mutations in otherwise somatic mutations in otherwise germline negative patients. Mostly in Correct. Job, right? Although I'm not sure, I guess your question is, can we use somatic sequencing to enhance the positivity in the germline? One of it's obviously technical issues, and we have that too. Um, and, and poking fields with a fine needle, of course, it's not a good idea. Surgeons hate that. Um, we also worry about somatic mutations, although I have to admit we have looked at that with my collaborator, Hartmut Neumann. And the somatic mutation frequency, meaning truly a second somatic hit, um, is variable. So, so it could, in fact, fool us. Is it somatic or germline? This is actually also a complicated area just to point out because the issue of some of these mutations are imprinted and nobody's actually been ever been able to figure out what the imprinted tissue is. So they clearly only uh, affect susceptibility when inherited from the father, but no one's determined um, what the tissue is that's infecting that. Um, and so it's a complicated sort of somatic issue. And that's SDHD especially. And and A, because they are in the same imprinting. And that's a very neat little paper in HMG. So, so can I ask both of you to, to maybe describe, and I should have asked this, and we'll ask it of, of all the speakers in this session. Um, could you describe what the collaborative opportunities might be for those around the table and, and in the room um, in terms of, of maybe expanding or building on your work? Yeah, so Kate and I and um, Matt Kalki at um, the Farber have started talking offline before this, so we thought it would be neat to bring it to a group because these are not exactly common tumors. We talk as broadly as forming a NAT, 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 and ET. Um, for things like this, is, are there quick rapid screens, like screening for germline syndromes, studying the uptake all the way, um, all the way to treatment consortia, because by I mean, this has been an amazing field from nobody cared about it to we know all these molecular pathways and lots of pathway-directed therapy coming up. And might I say for people with germline disease, we really should be thinking of prevention. Right. And I think actually there are a lot of clinical issues. Matt Murray and I actually also as part of this and 
um, put together a uh, group to ACMG to develop surveillance, to develop genetic testing guidelines for these patients. There are no published genetic testing guidelines. That's true. Um, there are no surveillance guidelines um, for patients at risk. And actually, one of the issues that we run into, and I'm sure both of you run into, is how do you manage these patients after they're diagnosed? Should it be the same for the different mutations? So I think there are a lot of opportunities to develop sort of best practice guidelines um, here in many different venues. And I think what Karis is emphasizing is um, also multi-institutional uh, targeted therapy trials for patients with metastatic disease, particularly as many of them have inherited diseases, inherited mutations. The other thing that I just mentioned that directly relates to the surveillance piece is that um, Josh Schiffman at uh, Primary Children's Hospital and the Huntsman Cancer Institute has, in fact, instituted a surveillance protocol, particularly for the paraganglioma families. And preliminary results are very encouraging that, in fact, there's a high degree of preventability, which is another one of those gospel axioms that you can't do anything about it that appears to be about to get an X through it. So uh, I think that uh, that would be, uh, you know, uh, definitely something that needs to be considered in, in the overall consortium approach um, and would be a, a likely collaborator. I agree, and that's something that Karis and I have certainly talked about. And I think the other thing that I know Josh has done is the issue of implementation of rapid full body MR as a screening tool for patients with these diseases. Um, and that's actually something that um, is very hard to get paid for because of the CPT codes right. um, and something that's actually much quicker, much um, less, shall we say, invasive and should be, is in fact cheaper than with the standard screening that we employ. Um, and so I think there are a lot of venues to really translate this um, uh, and different avenues which larger groups are needed to be able to um, move this forward. And of course underlying all this and is rarely said is that we would like to study the cost, true cost effectiveness as well, something you guys are very, very good at.